Well, folks, uh, grace to you and peace of this morning from God our Father, our, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Folks, uh, this morning we're going to meet three men. Three men who had their lives radically changed by God. She, uh, Jenny just talked about Jesus 180, and uh, that's what we're going to read about uh, today. We've heard in our Old Testament and uh, the two New Testament texts. We're going to see how God changed and renewed their lives. And we're going to ask God to do the same for us. Because at the heart of our faith, it's not just about status quo. It's not just about going and going with the crowd and going. It it is about transformation. It's about transforming our life. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life, might have it abundantly. It doesn't mean that all things are going to go well for us, but, but that whatever comes our way, we recognize there's a power within us greater than anything that can come upon us. Now that's, our, that's God's desire for us. Three men whose encounter with God followed a similar path. And Luther, Martin Luther will come along and talk about how this transformation, how this renewal of our lives, our commitment, our relationship with the Lord happens regularly, every day. We die to our baptism every day. So, this Old Testament text, the first of these paths, folks, was a, was a very painful and, uh, and or profound moment of self-discovery. And we're never too old for this. Remember Isaiah, he, right, he calls out, Woe is me! He cries out when he encounters God. I'm ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips. Now, I want you to know that Isaiah was a good man, folks. He was, he was a righteous man. But suddenly, in the presence of God, when it was no longer comparing oneself with another person and their foibles and their failings, you realize we're up against the Lord. And we all stand before that. In the presence of God, suddenly Isaiah sees himself as he really was. He saw that much of his righteousness like our righteousness, was limited, and it was full of holes. Simon Peter probably thought that he had it made too. He was pretty proud of himself, thought a lot of himself, thought very highly of himself. After all, he owned his own fishing boat, he was a successful small businessman, if you, as you read between the lines there. He had his work, folks, he had his family, he had his health. What more could anyone ever ask for? Self-made man. Peter didn't know. He didn't know the answer to that until that fateful day when he crossed paths with Jesus of Nazareth. Notice his response when he realizes just who Jesus is. Depart from me, what? Depart from me, Lord, Master, Boss Man, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Depart from me, Lord, he said, for I'm a sinful man. There's a humility there, folks. There was a, there is a, there is a humbleness. It wasn't like, here am I, Lord. You know, you are so lucky, man. I, I've got it all together. He said, no. He said, depart from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. Like Isaiah, Simon Peter realized just how empty, how meaningless his, his, life, his life had really been, that there were some voids there that he had missed something along the way that his complacency was shattered that day, that day that he met the Master and discovered the truth, not only about Christ, but about himself. 
And you're even within the Christian community, at times, we are guilty of, of pointing fingers. And we believe that's it's important that we, that we point out others' issues. But, you know, the Christianity 101, folks, is about those three fingers pointing back at ourselves. And that maybe what we need to take more time with at times is, is looking at how we stand before the Lord instead of thinking what others ought to be doing. That there's a humility about our faith. There's a recognition. There's this self-exposure. As for St. Paul in this text today, he also had a different name before he, um, before he met the resurrected Christ. He was Saul. Folks, he was the dreaded persecutor of the early Christian. He, did, he wanted nothing to do with the Christian church. I mean, what a radical change took place in his life the day that he met the Master. Came face to face with him. And suddenly, he was aware of just how misguided, how cruel, how vindictive his previous life had been. And i got to tell you, it's really hard for me, it's hard for us to believe that Saul the persecutor would become Paul, the author of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the greatest living document in literature on the subject of love. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not demand its own way, and la di da di da di da Only Christ could make that change in a person. Jesus, 180, that Jenny was talking about. And what does Paul then say about himself? For I am the least of the apostles and don't even deserve to be called an apostle. I mean, he could have said, look at me, man. He said, I am the least of these. He recognized what God had done in his life. All three of these men, when confronted with divine power and with perfection, with Jesus, saw themselves as they really were, sinners in need of God's grace. And I'll tell you, each of us, each of us needs to see ourselves as we really are. Christianity 101 here, folks. We need to do it daily. Rather than point there, we've got to look inside. That we need to see ourselves as we really are if we're going to become what God has called us to be. The path of self discovery is going to lead us to seeing our sinfulness. Okay? And I'll tell you, that is an important step. And I'm, at times, we in the Christian community, we don't do that very well. As Jesus said, before you try to pluck out, you know, that, 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 that speck in another person's eyes, take, the, you know, take that, that log off yours. You know. And that, 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 to me, is always, that, that's a good lesson. That's something I want to remember. And we all want to remember. But the second, the second path is the experience of divine grace, folks. Isaiah cries out, Woe is me, I'm ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. And, and, and then a seraphim touches Isaiah's lips with, with a live coal. And what does he say? He says, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Peter acknowledges his own guilt and immediately Jesus tells him, Peter, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm going to make you fishers of men. I got a plan for you. We're going to move together here forward. We're not looking back. We're looking forward. That's forgiveness. 
And St. Paul writes, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Just that sense of recognition that all that he has, all that he is, is a gift from God. That is a eureka moment, and it's something that happens regularly. So let me ask you a very important question, each of you. Have you ever really experienced divine grace? And I know you have. Folks, none of us are perfect. Just forgiven. Not because we deserve it, but because God has granted it. Yeah, I remember struggling, folks, struggling mightily when I, when I would sing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. Because I'll tell you, I never, when I was young, I never felt myself to be a wretch. I mean, I took pride in my self-sufficiency, folks. I took pride in my respectability. I stubbornly claimed I can help myself. And because, folks, I never felt the need for salvation as a young man, I'd never encountered the Savior. In baptism, I was claimed as God's own, and I but I got to tell you, the Savior kept knocking. He kept knocking. To see ourselves as we really are and to experience the bountiful grace of Jesus Christ, folks, is one of the most dramatic experiences available to men and women. Sometime in each of your lives, in each of our lives, we've come to realize our absolute dependence on God. And I know you have. I know I have. Our absolute dependence upon God, and we experience God's power to make us into a new creation, which Jenny's talking about. This is the lesson, unbeknownst to the two of us in planning this stuff, that's the lesson that our kids are going to be taught this summer at at camp in which we talk about regularly in confirmation and in Sunday school. Because when we realize that, when we come, become a new creation, that in that we know the joy of our salvation. Our faith, folks, your faith in a God who so loved you that he gave his life for you, is, is meant to bring a joy to our lives. It doesn't bring a happiness and a giddiness all the time because life is hard, but, but there's a joy because we know we're not alone. Christianity 101. Seeing ourselves as we really are and experiencing God's grace. This is how real change takes place in your life and mine. But that's not the end of the journey. In fact, it's just the beginning. Once we recognize what God's done for us, the completion of this journey is, is a call, folks. It's a, it, however many more years you've got left on this earth, you've got a calling. It's, it's a call to live life to the, in, to the fullest, knowing that you and I, we are God's children. We're not here just by chance and to fill up space. You're part of a divine plan. And so you and I, we are, are to walk confidently and, and yet humbly as the children of the king. That is my, it, to live confidently, to walk confidently into a new day, to be humble, recognizing we're children of God. Why? Because we know that our lives have ultimate worth. 
Man, I, I deal with so much low self-esteem when I visit with people. That, that's what I hear. There, that it's not humbleness. It, it, it's false humility that I hear so often. Low self-esteem. I want you to know that your life, my life, folks, has ultimate worth because Christ died in your behalf. Christ died in your behalf. Don't ever forget that. That's what you mean to God. You and I, we've been given a gift that is priceless. It's priceless. It's the gift of acceptance by Almighty God. So what shall we do with it? That's the question. Now as we move forward, shall we linger in the shadows Unsure that we deserve such a gift? No, I don't really. Or shall we move out of the shadows, folks, to share that gift with everyone that we meet? Working with ninth grade confirmation students this afternoon, the story, what we deal with today is we're talking about confessing our faith in a dying world. How do you do that? Part of this dynamic life to which we are called is to be ambassadors for Christ. Ambassadors of God in this world. What did Isaiah say after he was made worthy? After he recognized he'd been forgiven and God said, you know, Isaiah says, he heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. That's the attitude, folks, of all Christians. That others might see in our words and in our actions, that rather than words of judgment and, 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 and pointing fingers, to be able to say in, in our words and in our actions, somebody says, You've got something that I don't have. What is that? That's witness. What did Simon, what did Jesus say to Simon Peter after he declared himself unworthy? He says, he says to Peter, don't, he says, don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to be catching people. Man, we have got a future, he says. What happened to St. Paul? The self-professed least of all the apostles. He was responsible for, responsible for touching many, many lives with the good news of, of Christ. And part of that rich, full life to which we are called is to be emissaries of God in this dying world, folks. This world needs Christ. It needs his teachings. It needs to know about his life and his giving his life for others. What a radical notion in a world that says, me first, it's all about me. So it all begins with a confrontation with the living God. Folks, I'm, I'm telling you it's good if you are in a confrontation with the living God. I pray that you are. I pray that you and God are just confronting one another. And there we'll see ourselves as we really are. And as we ponder the truth that we can't save ourselves, we experience God's amazing grace. Man, I hope, you've, I hope you have known that. I hope you know that. As a result of that experience, you and I, we go out with a sense of direction. I take each day in the morning, I... I, I believe my life, your life, we have a sense of direction. We have a sense of purpose and of divine destiny. Christ called us to be his emissaries in a dying world. Friends, go make a difference. Amen.